Welcome to the Exeter webinar series. Today's topic is alarm management. We're going to talk about five years and counting the ISA 18.2 alarm management standard. My name is Todd Stauffer. I'm the director of alarm management services here at Exeter and actually an editor and voting member for the ISA committee. So we'll talk about the ISA standard, what it means, what we've learned about it over the last five years, and in general, talk about what's happened in alarm management over the last five years. We'll look at some of our, some lessons learned from applying the standard over the last five years, as well as how do we take what's in the standard and create an effective alarm management program. So first, let's talk a little bit about who is Exida. We are a global supplier of products and services for process safety, cybersecurity, and alarm management. We're an industry leader in the area of safety instrumented system design and certification of people, processes, and practices. So if you've ever designed or put together a safety instrumented system using SIL rated equipment, chances are that equipment was actually certified and assessed by Exida. We also have a tool set for safety instrumented system design which includes options for doing conducting PHAs, for doing SIL verification and SIL selection, and a tool called SIL Alarm which is used for alarm rationalization. We'll be talking about that a bit in today's webinar. I mention that because at Exida we consider alarm management to be a critical part of safety and we consider the SIL alarm tool to be an integral part of our safety lifecycle tool set. So let's talk about what's been going on in the area of alarm management. The standard ISA 18.2 was released on June 23rd in 2009 so it's been five years since then, a lot has happened. Continued evolution of alarm management, adoption of the standard, application of the standard, continuing to build the knowledge of alarm management. The EMUA 191 guideline was released in the fall of 2013. It's version 3. EMUA 191 is the really the, the starting point or the very first good reference on alarm management it was first created in 1999 out of the UK in response to a, an accident, a refinery accident and fire that had a lot to do with alarm management. So that really kicked off the alarm management um, focus. Now once the standard was released by the ISA 18.2 committee, we moved on to other tasks. A standard basically defines the what you need to do, but not the how to do it. That's what technical reports do. So the ISA committee formed six working groups, each with a focus on specific subsections or clauses of the ISA standard to provide additional detail to folks to understand how to apply the standard and how to meet the requirements. So there were six uh, technical reports created. Three of them have actually been completed and published TR 4, 5, and 6 on advanced alarming, on performance monitoring and assessment, and applications to batch processing. In the last two years, another working group was introduced, working group 7, which has a focus on applications for packaged systems, alarm management applications for packaged systems. Another exciting and important thing from the alarm management point of view was the development of an international standard on alarm management. The ISA 18.2 standard developed in the US was given to IEC to use as a basis for the development of that standard called IEC 62682 and it has moved along and is further along the process such that it is due to be released in approximately October of this year, October of 2014. So an international standard 
will be released based on the ISA 18.2 standard. So a lot of good things have happened in the world of alarm management. However, we have still had issues. So the, the world has gotten smarter and more knowledgeable about alarm management, but there has been some issues related to poor alarm management practices. One of them that we're probably that you're all probably very familiar with is the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in the US in 2010. That had an alarm management failure associated with it. And another one not quite as well known was a methyl chloride release here in the US in West Virginia that was investigated by the Chemical Safety Board. So we've learned a lot about alarm management best practices companies have started to apply that but we still have a way to go so let's talk about what ISA 18.2 is and why it's important it's a standard that defines the requirements and recommendations for what you need to do to manage alarm systems in the process industry it introduces an alarm management life cycle shown here which is really a, a workflow process for continuous improvement when it comes to alarm management. It provides the recipe for addressing common alarm management issues, whether it's nuisance alarms, alarm floods, etc., and documents how you can address them as a, as a means of following the, the standard. It also defines common terminology so that and users and engineering companies and suppliers can all relate to each other using a common set of terminology. And last but not least, in the US, it forms the basis of good engineering practices. So it's actually accepted as a recommended and generally accepted good engineering practice by OSHA here in the US. So if you need to uh, follow OSHA best practices if you're an OSHA PSM site or if your insurance company advocates that you follow best practices the ISA 18.2 standard rec uh, represents that. So one of the things that the standard does is define what an alarm is supposed to be. Now let's look at that definition. It's an audible and or visible means of indicating to the operator and the word operator is underlined because the operator is the target audience for the alarm system so all of the information through the alarm system must be understandable and actionable by the operator or else it doesn't belong in the alarm system it also needs to indicate an equipment malfunction process deviation or abnormal condition meaning that something is wrong Something unexpected has happened. And last but not least, it requires a response. More than just acknowledging the alarm or silencing the horn, we're talking about opening a valve or turning on a pump, something that will address the abnormal situation. So that's the definition of an alarm. And it helps us assess our alarm system as we review the alarms that exist and make sure that they meet that definition or meet that criteria. One of the alternate ways of looking at whether alarms are following this definition <coughs> is to assess them based on two questions. The first is whether it's an abnormal situation or not. Does the alarm um, represent an abnormal situation? And second, does the operator need to perform an action. So we're going to first assess an event and determine whether it's an abnormal or expected situation and secondly determine whether the operator needs to take a response or whether it's just for informational purposes. Interestingly enough if we look at all the different permutations we can see that one of the reasons that we have alarm management issues today is what's probably presented as alarms to the operator today represents information coming from all four of these boxes on this two by two grid and one of the things that the standard pushes us to understand is that we really need to make sure that the alarm system 
and the information that's transferred and displayed to the operator as an alarm truly represents just abnormal situations and times when the operator must act. These other types of notifications are still important to the operator and they need to know about them but in a different way outside of the alarm system. So now let's take a look at the alarm management life cycle which is one of the the key um, things that's proposed by the ISA 18.2 standard and we'll, we'll look at what the life cycle advocates needs to be done in each step of the life cycle as well as I'm interested I'll, I'll share some um, lessons learned from the past five years of actually applying the standard to real-life alarm management applications. So the first step in the process and the first phase or the first activity is creating an alarm philosophy document. Now an alarm philosophy is the guide for how you do alarm management at your site. It provides guidelines, it documents processes, it essentially defines your alarm management program. Everything from what makes a, a valid and good alarm to how you prioritize alarms to the colors that you use in the HMI to represent alarms roles and responsibilities, how you measure alarm system performance, all of that is, is relevant information to define or document in the alarm philosophy. Now there's a lot of good reasons why it's important to create this document and that's part of what the, the writers of the standard recognized and wanted to make as part of a key part of the, the standard and that's the, the idea of creating this philosophy it's really the cornerstone <clears throat> or the foundation of an effective alarm management program. Certainly if you want to have a program that is sustainable and maintainable over time, the idea of creating this philosophy which sets the structure, the guidelines that everyone can follow, is a key part of making a successful program. It also helps to create a common understanding of alarm management what an alarm is supposed to be, examples of good alarms, examples of bad alarms, things that shouldn't be alarms. The idea is to get everyone to understand this and get on a common ground and then drive consistency in terms of how the alarm system is designed and applied and implemented. It also can define how to solve common alarm management issues <clears throat> and, and one of the most important things that it does is it provides an opportunity for companies to wipe the slate clean or redefine how you do alarm management to kind of set the bar higher and say these are the way we do things today and because of the constraints that we have this is what we do but ideally we would like to do it in this fashion and that's what you look for when you define your alarm philosophy. It's an opportunity to set the, the bar higher in how you do alarm management and improve your operational efficiency. One of the key parts of the alarm philosophy document is creating the method or documenting the method for how you prioritize alarms. The alarm priority is a really critical attribute of the alarm system. That's really what the operator is supposed to key off of to know which alarm to respond to first. If you've got multiple alarms displayed at the same time and who doesn't, that the priority is what the operator looks at to know which one do I respond to first. So how do we prioritize alarms? What's recommended by the standard is to prioritize based on an analysis of the severity of the consequences if the operator was not responding to the alarm or was not able to respond to the alarm, that combined with the amount of time that's available to respond. That's the recommended practice for prioritizing alarms. Now it's not recommended to have more than three or four different priorities and ideally we'd like to to distribute them so that there's just a small fraction of all the alarms that are high priority. This would mean that when in the rare occasion that they do occur 
that they would be very significant and the operator would respond to them with a high level of urgency. Now one of the the methods for implementing that priority mechanism or method is to create a matrix that describes the potential consequences that could occur and has various descriptions to help you rank or grade the consequences in different areas such as in this case from a personnel safety point of view environmental and financial we couple that with uh, an estimation of how much time the operator has available to respond and that's how we come up with the priority so it becomes a very consistent objective way to prioritize the alarm so that if your alarms went through this type of system or this methodology and were prioritized an operator that sees a high priority an alarm will know that they need to respond or else one of these consequences that we have seen that we have shown here will occur so somebody could could be killed or we could have significant um, loss of production financial cost so the operator knows that it's them the buck stops with them to respond to that alarm to prevent that from occurring so they would treat that high priority alarm very seriously another thing that we talk about when we help clients develop philosophies is alarm shelving or manual suppression this is a, a feature that more and more DCS's support out of the box which is kind of a, a snooze button for the operator so an alarm occurs and there's something wrong with the alarm perhaps it's not functioning correctly or it's uh, being a nuisance and the operator wants to remove it from their view so they can focus on optimizing the process or dealing with the other alarms so shelving allows them to temporarily suppress that alarm so when you think about taking advantage of this capability you certainly have to know whether your DCS supports it and how it supports it and then from an operational point of view how might you take advantage of it many people are hesitant or many companies are hesitant to allow operators to suppress alarms there's certainly some risk to that so that's why as part of the, your philosophy development you really want to define the constraints for how operators can use this functionality so what alarms can be shelved maybe it's just the low and medium priority alarms maybe high priority alarms can't be shelved maybe alarms that are safety critical can't be shelved you also want to define whether as part of the process operators need to get some approval from a shift supervisor to shelve alarms do they need to record why they're shelving alarms things like that and, and incorporating into their operational routine route looking at the, a list of all the alarms that are shelved one of the requirements of any DCS that provides this capability is that it also provides the ability to see a list of all the alarms that are shelved so if you're going to take advantage of this from an operational point of view you probably want to add to your procedure that operators routinely review that list of shelved alarms another element of the ISA st standard that comes into play when we define alarm philosophies is setting up alarm classes or classifications classification is a way to group alarms that have common sets of requirements not all alarms are created equally some certainly the alarm occurs and you respond to it and, and life goes on then there's other alarms maybe related to uh, personnel safety gas detectors or fire detectors that you test maybe on a monthly basis or uh, practice responding to obviously they're a little different from your average process alarm the, the way to keep track of that is through this classification attribute so it's a way to organize or administer your alarm system and group alarms that have common or different requirements. So that's the philosophy process. The next stage in the alarm management lifecycle is 
called identification, which is the first step in the process of determining what points should be an alarm. So there are many different sources that can identify the need for a potential alarm from PNIDs to HAZOPs to, to LOPAs to your current existing control system configuration. But the idea is this is a two-step process. Identification of the potential alarm is just the first step. In the second step, we'll look at the alarm and judge it against the criteria that we establish in our philosophy to determine whether it's a valid alarm or not. So this step is really a collection point for potential alarms. So one of the things that's come up in the last couple of years now that we apply this is does it really make sense to document alarms on PNIDs? Typically PNIDs on a new facility come in first and indicate what alarms are proposed. Well, if that's just the identification step and it's not a tried and true alarm that should be implemented or configured until it moves to the next step in the, in the life cycle, which is called rationalization, then maybe it doesn't make sense to even have alarms identified on PNIDs. Are you going to continue to update PNIDs based on alarm design reviews and alarm rationalization? Maybe it doesn't, maybe for that reason it doesn't make sense to, to focus and have that information on your PNIDs. And there's actually been some good, good dialogues that have talked about whether alarms should be defined on PNIDs and then the other classification of event notifications called alerts which is similar to an alarm in that it's an abnormal situation, but operators don't need to respond to it, whether those should be shown on PNID. So a lot of good discussion related to what's advocated in the standard and how it actually gets applied in real life. Another area that has um, gotten a lot of good discussion is the interaction, again, of safety and the safety life cycle and the alarm management life cycle, because alarms that are used as safeguards or layers of protection actually bridge both areas. They're part of the alarm management life cycle and the functional safety life cycle. So the idea of how the designs work together and making sure that they're complementary has, has started to come to the forefront. The next stage of the alarm management life cycle is called alarm rationalization. This is where we take the list of all the potential alarms that we identified and judge them against the criteria for being an alarm. The criteria that we established in the philosophy, which could be the, the definition of an alarm that we looked at earlier, or it could be there could be additional criteria beyond that. So we use that to define whether it's a, a valid or a needed alarm. We're looking at the purpose of the alarm and we document that as well as then define what the, the priority should be and the alarm limit and things like that and re record that information in something that's called a master alarm database. So master alarm database is the term that the ISA standard defined as the list of the results of uh, alarm rationalization. Now one of the things that we're going to talk about a little bit is Exida's tool for alarm rationalization, which is called SILALARM, which actually guides you through the rationalization process as well as acts as the master alarm database to document the results. So let's look at the beginning of the rationalization process and what's involved in it. And as part of the rationalization process here, we're trying to assess whether it's a valid alarm or whether it's needed. So first we want to identify what's the, the cause of the alarm. We want to make sure that it's an unexpected situation, not an expected. <clears throat> and then we want to identify the consequence. What's the direct and immediate consequence that the operator themselves can prevent? So if we compare that to the ultimate consequence that you would identify in a HAZOP, it's actually very different. If we look at this layer protection scenario that we see here, for alarm rationalization purposes, the consequence of the operator not responding to the alarm is actually the trip of the safety instrumented system. 
for the purposes of a PHA or a HAZOP or a LOPA, the consequence is actually the, the fire or the release or the chemical spill or whatever is represented at, at the top of the, the chart there. So those are two different ways to look at the same kind of thing and we need to understand the similarities and the differences as we apply that um, to alarms that are part of both the safety life cycle and the alarm management life cycle. Next we define or talk about what the corrective action is. What's the operator supposed to do when this alarm occurs? And we, we Again we mean more than just acknowledging the alarm. What do they do to prevent the situation from getting worse or to, to stop the, uh, the deviation? We also recommend that you as part of the rationalization process, define a way to confirm that the alarm is real, that it's not a false alarm. Because certainly if the corrective action is to hit the emergency shutdown button and stop production, your plant will be safe, but you have stopped production. So nobody's going to be happy. So to help the operator figure out what the, the true cause is, and the appropriate corrective action as well as to confirm that they really do need to respond, we recommend that you define some confirmation steps as part of this objective analysis. Now by doing this, this helps us weed out alarms that are good and are necessary to have in the system versus those that we don't need. So if we look at a proposed alarm, an alarm, a potential alarm that came from the identification stage, if there's no consequence of the operator not if they don't respond if there's no consequence or the only consequence is another alarm occurring then there's no need for that alarm similarly if there's no corrective action that you can define for the operator we also don't need that as an alarm so this first step in rationalization then is a way to really filter out the alarms that don't belong versus the ones that provide value to the operator. Now when you use a tool to record this information like the SOIL alarm tool does, we can later on mine that information and make it available to the operators. As part of the rationalization process, that's not one person sitting in a room documenting all this. That takes place in a in a group, almost like a HAZOP, um, where you have people from different um, roles in the plant taking part in those discussion with a key role played by operations. So one of the most effective ways to do rationalization is to have your senior or most knowledgeable operators taking part, helping you define what they do or document what they do when the alarm occurs what's the likely cause of it. So you're actually kind of doing a knowledge capture process. And if you can record that in a tool like SIL Alarm, then we can actually extract that later and make it available to every operator. The second part of the rationalization process then, after we've completed the objective analysis and document the consequence, then we're going to prioritize the alarm using our priority matrix that we defined earlier in our philosophy, assessing the, the consequences and time to respond and ranking them and that will tell us what the priority should be. In some cases though we'll, we'll find scenarios where we won't use that matrix and we'll manually assign the priority, maybe given a, a rule set in the philosophy like uh, all um, safety shower activations should be high priority alarms or an alarm that doesn't quite meet the criteria for, for being an alarm will set it up as an alert so it's an alert priority we can define that stuff within the soul alarm tool after that we define the class or the classification so a way to group alarms that have common sets of requirements and for alarms that are safety relevant, we take the extra step then of documenting if they came from a HAZOP, what study it was, and the same for a LOPA, so that we then have a cross-reference to where that alarm came from so that if the rationalization or the alarm design changes any element of it, we know the affected safety study or the safety instrumented function that might need to potentially change. 
another thing that the, the standard has successfully done is to raise visibility into how you establish what the alarm limit or set point should be. In the past, folks commonly would set the limits for the high high alarm at 90 percent of range and high alarm at 80 percent and low at 20 percent and low low at 10 percent which means they had no idea what the process would do or what situations you were actually trying to avoid so now with the introduction of the standard there's a lot more visibility to the idea of you're actually trying to prevent a consequence from occurring. So if you can think about the consequence that we defined earlier in the rationalization process and at what point that occurs, that's called the consequence threshold, we would want to set the alarm limit or set point in relation to that. You know, if it's a if it's a high alarm, if it's a high pressure, we want to set the pressure alarm, the the high pressure alarm beneath that consequence threshold and set the value at a point where the operator will have enough time to respond certainly on a, on a raising pressure if you look at the rate of change there's going to be a, just a certain amount of time from when the process variable goes from the limit to the consequence threshold so we want to make sure the operator has enough time to respond so we're basically setting the alarm limit in relation to the consequence that we're trying to prevent but also making sure that we're not too close to the normal operating envelope that we end up with a lot of nuisance alarms during or nuisance activations during normal operating scenarios. So that's the rationalization process. The next stage in the life cycle is basic alarm design, which focuses on the configuration of the triggering of the alarm. The, selection of the appropriate alarm type and the design of uh, or the definition of dead bands and on delays and off delays. There was a, a study conducted by the ASM, the Abnormal Situation Management Consortium, that found that there, there was a reduction of 45 to 90 percent was achieved just by appropriately setting dead bands and on-off delays for alarms. Certainly application of dead bands can eliminate chattering alarms due to variation in a, in a process signal. <clears throat> so that's one of the key elements of basic alarm design. Another part of it, again, as I said, was defining what the appropriate alarm type is. So high alarm, high high, rate of change, deviation, change from normal. We want to select the appropriate type to deal with the situation. So as an example, let's say that we were running a process and we have two operational modes. In the first mode, we want the flow rate to be 50 gallons per minute. In the second mode, we want it to be 100 gallons per minute. We don't want the flow rate to get too high in either, either case. So we propose defining a high flow alarm. So now how do we set that high flow alarm limit or set point? Do we set it uh, in relation to the highest value, 100? Maybe at, we set the limit at 110. Um, that would work fine for the second mode, but not too well for the first mode. So we would need to be able to switch limits depending upon the mode that would be one way to apply it or if we thought more about it and said well ideally we just want to make sure that the actual flow is you know right where it's supposed to be so that the the actual flow rate is 50 gallons per minute plus or minus 5 or 100 gallons per minute plus or minus 10. So if we set up a deviation alarm in that scenario it's actually a better choice for alarm type for that particular scenario than the use of a high alarm. So that illustrates the thought process of making sure you're choosing the appropriate alarm type. As part of this design stage, it also includes advanced alarming, <clears throat> which is when we apply additional layers of logic to dynamically change alarm behavior 
or properties as a function of the state of the process or operating conditions. And if in some cases we might need to suppress alarms because they're not relevant during certain scenarios and that would be a, a technique that's called design suppression where the the smarts we we define smart alarming we create smart alarming that says we the control system measures enough attributes or enough process measurements or it has enough process measurements that it can determine what state the process is in and based on that we could tell it when alarms should be on or off or when they should have different limits or whatever so we can create smart alarming or design suppression to suppress alarms when they're not relevant or not needed. So here's an example defined in the SIL alarm tool for a compressor or a turbine trip. So the scenario is we're, we're running, we get a sudden power glitch and it causes the compressor to trip and creates a flood of alarms to the operator. And those individual alarms normally are valuable but in the event of the trip they're, they're not significant. They don't really help the operator understand what's going on. So what we want to do is create a design suppression application. So to do that, we need to define what conditions we look at in the process to know that the compressor has tripped. And when we see them, we can define what alarms we want to suppress. We can also say that if we're going to suppress all those individual alarms, we still need to tell the operator what's happening. So let's raise a common alarm instead that says the compressor has tripped rather than give them all the individual temperature and pressure and flow alarms and make them figure out what's happening. Let's suppress them and just present a common alarm. In the cell alarm tool, we can also review the safety impact of those alarms that you would propose to suppress to make sure that it's okay to suppress the alarm during that situation. There's a lot of examples of accidents that have occurred when alarms were suppressed, when equipment was offline or had de-energized, when they really shouldn't have been suppressed. And then we can also set a maximum suppression time. So that's an example of suppressing after a trip. Here's another example of suppressing when equipment is in a certain state. So a particular unit, a reactor is actually offline or not in operation. So in this case, we define the conditions again to know for sure when the reactor is offline. And we put a lot of thought into that because there's always some trepidation about suppressing alarms. So we don't do it um, on a whim. We definitely put a lot of thought into making sure that we'll truly be able to understand when the alarm should be suppressed we define the list of alarms that should be suppressed and then that same criteria actually for knowing for telling us when the suppression should occur we can use to tell us or to have the system know when suppression should stop so if we define conditions that must be satisfied for suppression to occur then that also means that when all those conditions are no longer satisfied that the suppression should be removed. So in the SIL alarm tool we define uh, advanced alarming requirements. We can create a, a report on that and then the idea is that would be implemented in the control system as an embedded solution. Now there's actually a lot of good discussion that now occurs in the alarm management community as to what is the best way to implement advanced alarming. As the DCS suppliers have, have enhanced their functionality and ability to support this, implementing suppression in the control system is a very viable option. There's also options where you use a third-party computer to read and write to the control system. So now as a result of the ISA standard being out there. Now we have dialogue and discussion on what's the best way and how do you define um, the best 
given certain requirements. And as another example for advanced alarming, let's look at um, a pump that has a low pressure, dis discharge pressure measurement or alarm on it. And uh, we want to know when that discharge pressure is low because it indicates we have some kind of a process supply problem. However, we also know that any time the pump stops, by definition, the, the pressure, the discharge pressure is going to be a low. So we're going to end up with that alarm. So to make sure it's not a nuisance alarm, we want to make it so that the system doesn't generate that low discharge pressure unless the pump is actually running, which is when we care about it. So we could implement that via state-based alarming or state-based suppression, design suppression application, or we could ap actually implement it following our basic alarm design process, which would say, let's only generate that alarm when the appropriate conditions are met. And in this case, it's not <clears throat> just the sole condition of when the pressure is less than a certain value, but it's the combination of when the pressure is less than a certain value and the pump is running. So we use that as the conditions to generate the alarm. And that's actually the, the preferable application for this scenario. So now the next stage is uh, HMI design. Now if we look at these two blinking process graphics, they're basically representing the same process, and, but we can see that our eyes focus very differently in the two of them. If we look at the one on the left, your eyes are drawn typically to the the two blinking green elements, which actually are not alarms, are not abnormal situations. It's very difficult to actually see the alarms on the graphic on the left. The alarms here are indicated in yellow and red, uh, but we can, in the same spot that they are on the right graphic, where you can see that it's very easy to see the alarms. They really pop off the screen at you. But in the graphic on the left, it's made difficult because your eyes are drawn to the blinking green, which is not an abnormal situation. And next, they're drawn to the yellow and the red of the process piping below the reactor, or in this case, the steam circuit. So your your brain or your your mental faculties are conditioned an operator is conditioned to recognize what colors represent abnormal conditions and we really mess that up when we use alarm colors like yellow or red for things other than alarms so one of the things that the ISA standard advocates is making sure or that you don't use alarm colors for anything other than alarm. So don't use it for process piping or representing values of what's going on. So what's recommended then is that you really make the visibility of the information um, consistent with its operational uh, importance. So background information is low visibility and then process values, medium visibility, and anything that's an abnormal situation, an alarm or a device that's not in the right state or whatever, that's when you use bright colors and blinking to draw the operator's attention, making it easy for them to quickly detect the presence of an alarm. Now there's a, a large fraction of the male population that's colorblind, somewhere between 8 and 12 percent. So we can't just use color to represent an alarm condition. We need to use um, symbols, we need to use text, we need, need to use other means besides just color to draw the operator's attention. So you can see here's an example where not only are we using color, but we're using different symbols, boxes, diamonds, triangles, circles, different letters to represent the priority, high, medium, and low. So that means even if an operator was colorblind, they would still be able to detect the alarm because of the presence of that auxiliary information. The next stage in the life cycle is, is called implementation. And what this stage 
deals with is really the process of putting the alarm or alarm system into operation. And it's mainly focused on initial testing and initial training of the operators. So if you think about what does it take to make an operator effective? Training. They need to know how to respond to each alarm. So individual alarms, they need to understand the what caused it, what do they do, what's going to happen. They also need to understand the system functionality and features, meaning how do they navigate to the process graphic where the alarm is, how do they get more information about what's going on to make the appropriate decision, how do they acknowledge alarms, how do they look at the shelved alarm list, etc. And they also need to be trained then on any specific procedures related to handling alarm scenarios. So if they're allowed to shelve alarms, the manual suppression element that we talked about earlier, what are the constraints? What is the process? What's the procedure for them doing that? So three elements to a, to a good operator training program. As part of implementation, the configuration of the control system is potentially resides here as well. And depending upon what kind of rationalization tool you use, whether if, if it's a commercial off-the-shelf tool like our cell alarm tool is, then we can actually take the information from rationalization and push that into the DCS so that the alarm configuration parameters are updated automatically. And you don't need to manually make those changes. Next comes the operation stage and then the maintenance stage. Operation is when the alarm is in service, performing its function. Operators are responding, dealing with the, the tools that you provide them for alarm management and handling alarm scenarios. Maintenance is when the alarm is actually out of service for repair, replacement, or testing. And this is of the alarm. So one of the things that we can do to help the operators perform better is to provide them with alarm response procedures. The idea of when an alarm occurs, give them the information of what happened, what they need to do, what's going to happen if they don't respond, how much time they have to respond, how they confirm that it's a valid alarm. And if you remember, that's the same stuff that we talked about um, defining during rationalization. So the idea of taking the information from rationalization and then turning it into an alarm response procedure is a fantastic way to get more value out of that activity. And again, as a knowledge capture process, make that information available to all the operators. So that will help them respond more effectively. Other tools to provide the operator, again, manual suppression or shelving, and we would want to make sure that the operators know how to use this functionality, how do they get access to it, to make sure they're reviewing a list of those shelved alarms at the beginning of each shift. They understand the process for shelving alarms and when alarms come off the shelf, what they need to do to reshelve alarms, etc. And the idea that you don't want to just continually shelve an alarm if it's not working, you need to get it fixed. So we want to make sure that we provide this tool because it's certainly a valuable tool to help them deal with alarm upsets, but make sure that they know the, the parameters for, around how to use it effectively and successfully. Now we've mentioned alarm suppression a couple of times. Now I want to dive into what it means and how it's defined in the ISA standard a little bit more. So suppression is really the a mechanism to prevent the indication of the alarm to the operator when that base alarm condition is present. And in the ISA standard there are three types of suppression defined with specific terminology and specific meaning to them. The first we mentioned earlier is suppression by design. This is the smart alarming logic. So this is when the control system itself knows what's going on. It's reading the process variables and it's determining what state the process or equipment is in and is automatically suppressing alarms based on that knowledge. So the alarms are actually under control of the logic. The second type is shelving. So this is a temporary means of suppression 
typically initiated manually by the operator to temporarily suppress an alarm. And in this circumstance, the alarm is under control of the operator. The third type of suppression is called out of service. This is when an alarm is suppressed, again, manually, typically for maintenance purposes, to test it or to fix it. And once it's out of service, it's not under control of the operator anymore it's really under control of maintenance and maintenance would <clears throat> notify the operator when it's okay to take the alarm out of service now <clears throat> out of service for the alarm is different from out of service or offline for equipment out of service for the alarm has to do with when the alarm is not functioning or needs to be tested or re replaced now in the standard you will not see the words disable or inhibit or hide anywhere and that's one of the most confusing things to people that read the standard for the first time and part of the reason why you don't see that is because those terms mean different things to different people and they operate or behave differently in different control systems so what the standard has done is define terms that clearly relate to what stage of the life cycle they're associated with and who is in control of the alarm. As I mentioned earlier, design suppression, <clears throat> that's when the control system is in charge of whether the alarm is suppressed or not. Shelving, it's the operator. If you take the term disable on that function, it could actually be all three different types of suppression depending upon how it's used you could programmatically write to the enable disable bit of an alarm that would be design suppression or a program could go through at each shift change and automatically change the enable status of alarms that would be shelving an operator could disable an alarm with with no controls and then that would be out of service so you can see that the word disable on that function doesn't directly correlate to just one activity or one part of the life cycle, which is why uh, the ISA committee decided to define things in the way that they did. So we just talked about operation. Next, we'll talk about maintenance, which is when alarms are taken out of service for repair or, or replacement or testing. Many times alarm problems, nuisance alarms, standing alarms, stale alarms are there because there's a underlying hardware problem with the transmitter or the, or the associated hardware with the alarm and that needs to be fixed to get rid of that alarm. So as part of that maintenance process, if you follow the standard and the terminology, alarms should really be placed out of service when they're in need of repair or in the process of being repaired. Now maintenance also includes testing which is another time when you might take an alarm out of service so that any f alarms that are induced because of the testing don't interrupt the operator so they would be suppressed and information about how frequently you test an alarm or the procedure related to testing is typically driven by the alarm class or the alarm classification. The next stage of the life cycle is monitoring and assessment, which is where you're actually measuring your alarm system performance and comparing that to the to KPIs that you established to say this is what our targets are that you established in your alarm philosophy. When you're measuring the alarm system performance, you're not only seeing how you compare to KPIs, but also identifying nuisance alarms and problem alarm scenarios that can then be fixed. And it's very important to use this data then to drive activity. In the past, before the standard was released and the alarm management lifecycle, the workflow process was defined there's many examples I would hear of companies that would purchase a tool for monitoring and assessment and would get all kinds of great data related to alarm system performance but didn't really have a process to to use that data to drive improvement 
So after a while, they actually stopped using the tool because it wasn't really providing them any benefit because there was no process improvement. There was no philosophy behind using that tool and what it should be used for, or how it should drive um, activities. So the ISA standard defines recommended uh, performance metrics for alarm system performance. Things like the number of alarms per day um, for operator position. 150 to 300 alarms is what's recommended. Now, of course these are true alarms that follow the definition that we established or talked about way earlier where an operator needs to respond. Um, in addition to that you see there's other metrics related to alarm floods, priority distribution, etc. that will help you to create a effectively performing alarm system. Now many DCSs today provide the ability to to do these performance analyses right within their tool. If it's if you have a legacy system in some cases the DCSs don't support that and you need to purchase a third party tool, but the idea is to to look for a tool that will automatically create reports for you to, to look at of all the relevant information so that you can compare it to what the ISA standard says or what the metrics that you defined in your philosophy as well as to analyze problem scenarios. So for example a report of all your standing or stale alarms would be very valuable to see on a monthly basis. Now to make that work you need to define as part of your roles and responsibilities in your philosophy whose job is it to create these reports and distribute them and then whose job is it to review them and recommend changes and actually take action. So again to make this successful requires a team approach and understanding of who's supposed to do what. Now here's an example of a, a report that's created that shows that provides data on your average alarm rate. The KPI in the ISA standard is averaged over 30 days. Now a, a good reporting tool will not only provide you that information but ways to dive into that data to learn a little bit more. Certainly if you're averaging over 30 days you can have significant fluctuations time periods when you don't have too many alarms and time periods where you have maybe more alarms than you should. And of course that would get smoothed over by averaging. So a good reporting tool will allow you to dive in and see alarms per day or alarms per 10 minutes so you can fine tune your assessment and understand how the system is really um, performing. Another key report to have that tool create is something called uh, frequently occurring alarms to identify your bad actors. So these would be the the 10 or 20 alarms in this case top 10 most frequently occurring alarms. The alarms that are creating most of the, the messages, most of the traffic for the operator. For a alarm system that has not gone through rationalization you may find that these top 10 alarms, so 10 alarms out of the thousands that you have configured are actually the ones that generate the majority of the alarm traffic. You may find that just these 10 create 50 to 80 percent of all the alarm activations, which is obviously not, it means they're not performing effectively. So as part of your improvement program, if you can fix those, you can drastically improve the performance and operator making it much easier for the operators to to do their job if they're not being inundated by nuisance alarms or chattering alarms. Another key thing to think about is management of change and that's another one of the stages of the alarm management life cycle. If you put all this energy into designing your alarm system, determining what alarm limits should be set at and priorities, then you want to put in place a, a semi-rigorous approach to make sure that any potential changes to the alarm system are appropriately reviewed and approved and authorized. Now most companies have a form of MOC already and what we found over the last five years is that in a lot of cases what you have 
can, can be applied to alarm management or what you have maybe needs some additional wrinkles to it to effectively deal with alarm management because one of the things with <clears throat> management of change is you want to make sure that it supports the the rigor and review that's needed but you also don't want it to create a a paperwork nightmare such that changes that that should be made are not because of the overhead of doing it so in some cases for alarms and alarm management you may implement different types of MOC levels depending upon the type of change a change to an alarm priority for a safety critical alarm or an alarm limit is a lot bigger deal than a dead band on a just a general process alarm so you may want to factor that into your MOC process to make sure that it's appropriately supporting what you need to do. The last stage of the alarm management life cycle is called audit. This is where you're essentially reviewing the processes that you've defined to make sure that you're following what you said you would and the alarm philosophy. You're really trying to maintain or enhance the integrity of your alarm system to make sure that you're doing what you said you would and you're getting the performance out of it that you wanted to. And there's a couple of different tasks that are involved in that. One of them is to compare the alarm settings that are in your control system <coughs> versus what's in your master alarm database to make sure that they're synced up and that no one is making unauthorized changes to the alarm configuration in the DCS without appropriate MOC occurring. Another task is to do um, surveys or interviews of the operator. Since the alarm system is for the operator, interviewing them to find out how it's performing, how it's working for them is a good idea. It helps to um, continually enhance the the efficiency, their efficiency, and making sure that the alarm system is supporting what they need to do. So here's an example of <clears throat> one of the tasks that I mentioned, which was periodically comparing what's in your master alarm database versus what's running in the DCS. And our Soul Alarm tool has, has the ability to do that and to give you a list of any changes or any differences between those two databases. Now let's change our focus to how do we create an effective alarm management program for ISA 18.2 compliance. Based on application over the last five years, this is what we've come up with as a, as a general <clears throat> flow of how to put together an effective alarm management program. So the first step would be to benchmark your performance. So certainly this is appropriate for a brownfield facility, an existing facility. If you are a greenfield, obviously it doesn't make sense. But as part of this benchmarking, we would use the, the tools from monitoring and assessment to measure the number of alarms per day to the operator and compare that to what the ISA standard says to get a feel for, for where we stand. We would also borrow some techniques from the audit phase to interview operators to get their qualitative assessment for how the alarm system is working and scenarios where it's not working or, or areas that need to be improved. Given that information, we can use that to create or help us create the alarm philosophy document, which again defines the rules or the recommendations guidelines for how you do alarm management including things like how you prioritize alarms which you have to have in place before you can do rationalization which is really one of the key first steps to really start to improve alarm system performance so we perform alarm rationalization implement that configuration in the DCS hopefully leverage or create alarm response procedures once we've done rationalization and then we measure our performance and see how we're doing. <clears throat> Depending upon how rationalization has, has affected performance, 
Um, oh, again, sorry, we, we measure our monthly performance and then based on that, we may find that we need to implement some advanced alarming techniques to deal with alarm floods. So we would do rationalization first, get rid of alarms that don't belong, get rid of a lot of nuisance alarms, get the normal static alarm load down, make things a lot better for the operator, and then realize that, well, there's a couple of scenarios that we still need to work on. Scenarios when upsets occur and the operator gets too many alarms then. So that's when we would look at implementing the advanced alarming. And then last but not least, on a regular basis, we would, or a yearly basis, sorry, we would audit the system to make sure that we're following the practices and procedures that we said we would. Now there's two loops here. There's there's the audit to philosophy loop, which is an annual basis or two years or three years. You define that in your philosophy. And then there's the continuous improvement loop, which is much more frequent. So it's the, we're measuring our alarm system performance, perhaps on a monthly basis. And based on those results, that's driving rationalization and what alarms we, we look to rationalize and fix and improve. So it becomes very much a continuous improvement program. So with that, I will say thank you very much for attending this Exeter webinar on alarm management. I hope that you'll be able to join us again in the future for other topics, whether it's on webinar Wednesday or any other time. If you have any questions on what you've seen or would like any additional information about what you've seen, please feel free to email me at the address shown here, tstoffer at exeda.com. And with that, I'll say goodbye again and thank you.